Hello and welcome to our first webinar in the National Government Series. My name is Ricklin Hookreed and I'm on the Defense and Intelligence team here at Esri. In today's webinar, we'll be discussing strategies for enterprise GIS in national government. Your presenters today are Ben Conklin, Jim Van Ostenbridge, Rand Billy, and guest speaker Shannon Ham from the U.S. Department of Agriculture. You may ask questions at any time during the webinar through the question box on your right and we will provide questions during the Q&A section at the end of the webinar. There will also be survey questions at the end of the presentation. We ask that you take a moment to complete the questions so that we may continue to improve on the quality of our webinars. This webinar is being recorded and will be posted on the same page you registered from. With that, I'm now going to turn over today's presentation to Ben. Thanks very much, Ricklin. So thank you for joining us today for our Beyond Technology Strategies for Enterprise, GIS, and National Government webinar. I'm Ben Conklin, and I manage our Defense and Intelligence Industry Solutions. I've been working for the past 20 years on different implementations of GIS in the Defense and Intelligence community, and through that, I've been able to observe a lot of large-scale enterprise implementations of GIS. And together with me and my colleagues, we'll be talking through today some of our observations and lessons learned to basically go beyond the applications of technology and really focus on strategies for enterprise GIS and national government. So all of us, of course, I'm sure are aware that we are living in this complex and constantly changing world and that digital technology is really transforming our world. It's enabling humans to be enormously successful. It's accelerating everything we do and transforming our society. It's changing how we think and reshaping our workforce and rapidly changing our organizations and our lives. This pace of change is increasing exponentially, and many of us are struggling to deal with how do we keep up with this change, both in technology and in the world today, in order to achieve our, our agencies and organizations' mission and to solve these complex problems. At the end of the day, our goals are pretty simple, and that is to work together to solve big problems and to serve our citizens and country. Governments that are able to work together quickly, effectively, and securely by sharing resources, budgets, or information needed to solve big problems can better serve citizens and communities at many different levels. Of course, today, you know, many of us are dealing with one of the largest, most complex problems we've seen in our lives, and that of COVID-19. Now, this webinar is not about COVID-19, but of course, we can't have a discussion today without thinking about this. We know that you are all impacted by this current pandemic whether your agency is responsible for responding to it or you're just dealing with changing circumstances. Well, while we're not focusing on it, we already see that GIS is having an impact on in mitigating the impact. We're seeing thousands of organizations use location intelligence to respond to this event. For some organizations, this has been straightforward as they leverage their existing investment in enterprise GIS. For many, this crisis has forced them to quickly stand up new capabilities in their organization and learn about the importance of an enterprise capability that touches their entire workforce. To begin with, many of course are using GIS to manage the response and the recovery. So working with integration of data around the pandemic, testing, management of resources and results, management of mitigation and response, and of course moving forward helping with the recovery overall. In addition, one of the growing areas we're seeing is this, is this idea of using GIS to help us with our overall business continuity. So this is where we see a lot of the growth into departments that maybe traditionally didn't realize that location was important. So there's the HR departments and customer service and even in some cases corporate leadership who need to understand both the safety and well-being of their, of their staff, but also their ability to, to deliver services. And many of you, of course, in government have these same problems as you think about your service delivery and staff geographically. If you need more resources related to the COVID crisis, you can, of course, visit our website, esri.com slash COVID-19. So we move beyond this crisis and look more broadly at how GIS is used across um, large organizations. I think one of the best examples of this is the United States, United States Census. So, of course, you've, you've uh, are seen all their wonderful, amazing commercials talking about the importance of the census. And really, that's because the census helps um, drive every decision that we make across government. And every decade in the United States, they must count every person. Interestingly, around 10 years ago, they started with a new problem, which was a reduction in their budget, but still the same no-filled mission and the increasing population that they would need to count in the next decade. 
They have this idea that they needed to automate and digitally enable their workforce, including their field crew. In the past, all censuses were completed on paper. Last census, 600,000 people were deployed. And this census, they're actually going to be conducting the census with only 400,000 people. So what do they do to accomplish that? They created a, a digital strategy about helping them think differently about the way to conduct their mission. They leverage location and intelligence to develop canvassing plans to do address verification in the office, which helped change their processes. They ready to, to mobilize the largest workforce since World War II with digital collection, training and enabling that workforce. And they're confident they're gonna deliver more accurate data of a larger population with a reduced budget. Even with the current crisis, this work has, has been very helpful and, and, and this digital enablement has probably helped reduce the impact of the crisis on the census. Help them establish where to count. In 2010, 100% of households were canvassed in the field during the planning stage. In 2020, by using GIS in the office to do their address verification, they were able to reduce their workload by 66%. It was an amazing accomplishment. And I'm sure there's great many more things to come as we go through the completion of the census process. The next organization that we're going to talk about is one that, of course, is, is something you're hearing about daily in the news and maybe relying on in many different ways as you conduct your own agency's mission. That's the World Health Organization. So the WHO is responsible for improving the health of the world, and of course, we are all relying on them often. They provide support through numerous organizations globally, and they ma they're managing and engaging stakeholders is critical to their success. And location is a crucial element of health and operations data to support global crises. However, it is more than just technology. What WHO realizes is that they need to provide a digital solution, data, and training in order to improve resources and solution delivery, especially in remote areas of the world or areas with smaller economies or more difficult challenges. They, they support missions like the global polio eradication, health emergencies, malaria, and of course, the current crisis today. The actions they took were to develop a digital platform and solution to improve their service infrastructure to these remote areas, specifically to developing nations. They developed, delivered, and trained individuals in countries across Africa to help train their workforce. By training the workforce to collect data, they were able to develop their own insights and delivery for improved medical intelligence and measurement as their workforce in the field collected data in real time. Data and collected and shared with the WHO helped make more accurate and informed decisions, better data, better insights, and more confidence in use of resources, which improve their information. So they work on a common infrastructure to share authentic data and to help make decisions. And of course, again, we all see the benefits of this today, and we see the areas that they're working to improve and have been improving on, on a regular basis. The next organization that we're going to look at is, of course, one that I have the most interaction with on a regular basis, and that's the U.S. Army. So the U.S. Army, of course, is one of the largest military fighting forces in the world. They need to fight off one map across a variety of systems, from headquarters to remote command posts and vehicles and even embedded into sensors. And they need to be able to support everything, including intelligence, operational readiness, and combat operations. The, the Army acquires technology and systems and thousands of programs, and in order to ensure operability, they need to have a comprehensive geospatial enterprise. The core to this success is the establishment of a governance approach. Based on the size and scale of the Army, this occurs at many levels, from a three-star senior leadership down to a working body of colonels and a standing task force. The governance connects geospatial enterprise expertise to the Army's programs and systems. The Army GIO plays a key role in sponsorship and support for initiatives and standards. As you can imagine, managing the Army geospatial enterprise is one of the most complex in the world. And this governance has proven effective in improving interoperability across the systems from headquarters to warfighter. Next, we're gonna take a step away from the government and non-governmental organizations and look at a White House for Digital Ready Organization, and that is Schneider Electric. Schneider was an equipment manufacturer but created an organization and business processes to help make them constantly innovative. They do this with an organization of 144,000 employees and over 24.7 billion in revenue. The key point here is that innovation isn't just for little Silicon Valley startups. Big organizations can do it, but they need to have processes in place to do innovation at scale. They created a resilient and flexible utility grid to support the power that runs our lives. The core to their success was in this digital practice. They wanted to move away from being a commodity equipment manufacturer into a solution provider and really focused around the IoT revolution ahead of everybody else. They put sensors on the equipment and they created something new. 
They created a digital practice about integrating and connecting all of their assets, sensors, or utilities, and GIS was core to this. They have a process in their organization to constantly create innovative solutions around this digital offering, making new offers and business models. This helps them keep ahead of their competition and helps them have highly tailored solutions for their customers. They have created a digital company built around the five building blocks of digital transformation that we'll speak about in a moment. As we think about digital transformation, it's key to realize that it is an ongoing process and that it requires more than just technology. Digital transformation is about integrating successfully in an organization, both people and processes, as well as technology in order to change how, how, your, operate, how your organization operates. It requires this integration of people, technology, and operations. And we see kind of two specific areas of focus when you're thinking about developing the digital transformation process in your organization. We like to focus on governance, which is really around the, the people who are understanding and aligning the investments and the direction, as well as the foundational processes and procedures for strategy, for processes, organizations, and people that you need to implement as a routine part of your uh, DNA in your organization to help make you successful. So most of you are in agencies that of course are undergoing digital transformation. Every agency has some form of a digital transformation initiative. The goal of this is to establish a common platform that serves as a single source of truth for an organization and can help facilitate collaboration and reduce fiction. The goal is to transform into a digital organization. It helps governments and agencies understand their citizens better and achieve better outcomes, provide services more efficiently and effectively, find new solutions to policy challenges, engage with external partners to develop new delivery models, and improve safety and security by anticipating threats and managing response. As we apply location lens to this digital transformation, we see that the, same, the tenants are the same. A common location platform that serves as a single source of truth for an organization. It facilitates collaboration and reduces friction, under, helping us understand operations when they occur across a common lands, landscape. Geography becomes essential to every enterprise at the moment when there are coordinated organizational performances across this landscape. As we've seen in this current crisis, this means extending GIS to everybody in the organization. So I'm sure you're wondering, how do you become a digital organization and what does digital transformation look like inside of an organization? We really need to focus on the core business of your organization, the data and technology. What has worked in the past probably won't work in the future, what organizations like Schneider Electric have demonstrated is that there's five key building blocks to this digital transformation. First is an operational backbone, which is a set of integrated systems and processes that assures operational efficiency and quality transactions on master data. Second is to pursue the development of shared insights, organizational knowledge about the services for your customers and how digital technology can deliver on their demands. Next is realizing a digital platform, a repository of business and technology and data components, facilitating rapid innovations of new offerings and enhancements, key offerings and services, digital offerings. Next is assembling an accountability framework, so that importance of governance and ownership and coordination among your offerings and components. And finally, engaging with external developers and partners by building an external developer platform that helps you create an ecosystem of partners. So with summarizing this digital transformation initiative, I'm now gonna turn it over to Jim, who's gonna take you through some of the key processes and methods that are involved in that process. Over to you, Jim. My, my name is Jim Van Austin Bridge. I'm a solution architect uh, here at Esri on uh, Esri's global architecture uh, practice team. and uh, I've been at Esri for nearly 14 years, been in the GIS industry for about 30. Um, and I've worked across multiple industries, but my predominant focus is national government um, uh, here at Esri. So um, what I'd like to uh, uh, start off by emphasizing is that something you know, all of you probably already know, the digital transformations focus on strategic outcomes. In each of the case studies and, and uh, guidance from MIT that Ben highlighted, there's a, a need to emphasize that, that digital, effective digital transformation initiatives must focus on strategic outcomes that are brought about by pragmatic investments. So what do they need to achieve? Commonly, it's enabling coordinated execution, 
and improving organizational performance. Now, while each of these organizations may have you know, you know, detailed and specific goals and, and measures that are associated with the achievements of those outcomes, common measurements uh, are, are really focused on improvements in productivity, profitability, efficiency, and effectiveness. Now, as Ben was highlighting, you know, geography becomes essential to every organization, every enterprise. At the moment, there's an expectation of coordinated organizational performance across a shared landscape. I'm sure all of us have been in, in, in a meeting where there, uh, there are 10 people around the table and 10 different perceptions of uh, geography across time and trying to reconcile that without having uh, common authoritative information. This is uh, specifically why geography is essential to an organization, especially with, this, uh, with distributed resources. So if you keep that in the strategic purview in mind, let's consider what the strategic impact of GIS might be. And the business impact uh, can really be thought of in these three categories. And you might have uh, multiple instances of, of, or examples of these categories in your organization today. At an individual level, you know, people perform projects. Uh, uh, GIS is an, is an application or tool that, it, that amplifies the productivity of an individual. But as we ascend to teams or departments, there's a necessity of, of working together in a more co coordinated fashion. There's more specialization where some people work on data management, some people work on analytics. Some people are you know, leaders, managers, and knowledge workers that need focus applications rather than general use tools to uh, uh, to remain uh, uh, focused again on their daily work. What we're seeing emerge much more frequently now is the necessity of, of evolving to an organizational level. Uh, so we can overcome these uh, silos of excellence and people across uh, an organization, you know, wh whether they be in one mission or business unit or another, are able to collaborate effectively. And what this suggests is that there's a, a need to uh, transition, not just technically, but in, in perspective, from tools to platforms. A platform perspective really focus, focuses much more thoroughly on how people work together, and that informs decisions about you know, what kind of, uh, of technology and resource choices are made to invent, invent the future. So, We've been talking a lot about, uh, about strategic outcomes. Here's a simple definition of a strategy. A plan, or, uh, a plan of action or policy designed to achieve a major aim uh, uh, that's over, uh, of overall importance to an organization. Well, of course, leaders create strategies to achieve goals and realize intended outcomes. But that, uh, in uh, making such a simple statement, uh, there is an expectation of change from the way things work today to way, the way they need to tomorrow. And the, the essential nature of crafting a roadmap or a plan to get uh, from point A to point B. Of course, while we're con uh, constructing a plan, uh, the organization can't stop what it's doing today to do what it needs to do tomorrow. We need to bring that about in stages. So the purpose ultimately of a strategy is then to change the function and behavior of an organization to deliver new value. It's not just uh, it's not just how the organization works, it's function. It's how the organization behaves, how people interact that uh, that enables these new value propositions. So let's think of this from the standpoint of a geospatial strategy, which we define as a business-oriented plan that defines how an organization will use GIS to achieve its goals and desired outcomes. And that plan includes considerations of people, processes, data, and technology needed to meet priority goals and overcome challenges. And the interesting thing about, uh, about challenges as they relate to organizational goals is that uh, the, the goals of leaders suggest that the organization should function and behave differently tomorrow than it does today, which of course creates uh, some direct tension 
between how people work now and how they need to work in the future. So let's you know, now cast this into a geospatial strategies purpose, which is leveraging geography locate and location to change the function and behavior of an organization to deliver new value. Now, this of course, as I've been saying, doesn't come about uh, on its own. Like anything an organization does well, it needs to be led and managed. So strategies are built uh, for and by people. I've been highlighting you know, the goals of leaders. We need in invested executive sponsors that, that want this change to, uh, to occur, but we also need good coordination with technical leadership and enterprise IT. The central role of the champion is uh, that of uh, an individual or group that guides uh, the, you know, this change forward. First, understanding what leaders need to achieve, then you know, engaging with stakeholders and building a stronger uh, understanding of what the future ought to look like. So where should a champion start? Of course, a champion should start with, you know, with the, the people that the, the technology is, is most intended to serve with leaders, management, uh, uh, the workforce that, uh, that need to use technology every day, but aren't necessarily technologists. For leaders, they expect to be able to, uh, to access timely and accurate operational and situational awareness. They need to be able to put their finger on the pulse of the organization at any given time. Operations management is something that managers uh, like to uh, have at their fingertips as well, to be able to translate uh, the goals and expectations directions from, from leadership into the activities of the workforce and understand how the workforce is doing against those, uh, doing against those assignments. In order to do that, managers oftentimes need to be able to craft presentations or briefings to provide status, not just about what's happening right now, or what happened in the past, but what is expected to happen in the future, and how that uh, paints the, the picture for leaders, leaders to guide uh, a further direction of organizational uh, function and behavior. Ultimately, as we get into the workforce, digital collaboration becomes essential, not just between the roles in, in one, uh, within one mission or business area, but across mission and business areas. And so people can uh, can capitalize on each other's work. Now in the workforce, we have people that are going to use desktop, web, and mobile applications to access it and, and apply their capabilities both you know, in the office or in the field. Now, anal uh, analysts have a very special role, and especially as uh, the, uh, the volume and variety of content that we work with every day expands. And that is not just to discover and develop analytics, but also to deploy them so that, that uh, people in the top three tiers here are capable of, of applying those analytics in their daily work. Now, of course, you know, analysts need to be uh, tapping into a well-managed foundation of organizational content. And what we've learned over the years is, is that and it's really difficult to say there is only one version of the truth. Um, and what we've come to recognize is we have data pipelines, we have content in process, we have multiple truths that exist uh, in those processes, and there are different processes that need to be managed in those pipelines. Content integration uh, between multiple systems is essential, and of course, master data. A good example of, of a shifting perception of, of master data where you know, once we might have uh, thought of having one master data repository with that uh, with that single singular version of the truth, organizations turn to say telemetry and look at the feeds themselves as their master data. Um, of course, here we're also concerned with shared services. I think what's, an, what's ultimately important about uh, this depiction of, of an organization is that many tend to tend to start with the foundation and work their way upward. Whereas you know, the, what's been shown to be effective is understanding the way that, that non-technical staff need to work in, and then building downward 
to be able to uh, provide the greatest measure of value that the enterprise uh, to the enterprise need. Now, with the uh, uh, confident execution of these practices and processes within the enterprise, it's much more feasible to extend you know, these capabilities to uh, external communities, such as partners, contractors, and consumers. Building that confidence internally is essential to be able to work at scale and be able to have, you know, have a set of reliable practices and processes so that when these external communi uh, communities interact with your agency, they, uh, they have confidence that they're, they're dealing with, you know, with information and the work of people that they can rely on. So as we walk through these diagrams, and I'm, I hope you've taken note of uh, some uh, added scope that maybe your organization needs to pursue. Maybe you've, you've thought about your role in that. I think it's, it's uh, clear that making these changes is, is often challenging because it requires resources that you know, basically people that are able to focus on what the change needs to be. For operational staff, it's very difficult to make these uh, make these changes with the the burdens of their of their daily work. But being able to uh, uh, to assign a champion or a group of, of individuals to lead and manage the effort, interacting with with or um, enterprise IT and and executive sponsors, that helps to identify priority outcomes and investments that are going to really be impactful that helps to clarify what resources are gonna be required to get it built and delivered ultimately. And you know, implementation, as, as we've noted, isn't as, as easy as just getting the, a new solution done and, and turning it loose on the enterprise. It needs to be you know, uh, carefully deployed into the organization to ensure that it harmonizes with other work and that there are other uh, solutions that and maybe it may have already existed as, as legacy capabilities that need to be stood down. Ultimately, there's a solution portfolio that needs to be maintained. So many organizations build governing coalitions. This could be a governance board, it could be uh, a Basically, panels of of of, uh, of re responsible and accountable individuals, but the the model that we're showing here is a good representation of I think where we're going, and this is this is actually a um, a, uh, a borrowed uh, design because I thought it did such a good job at, at expressing what we uh, you know, what we need to do with on the geospatial front that's happening with other technologies. This, is, this example was uh, from an article that appeared in the Harvard's, Harvard Business Review that focused on artificial intelligence for the enterprise, suggesting that there's a necessity of, of uh, a hub that's led by uh, a C-level executive that, you know, that oversees centralized respo responsibilities to uh, to guide the, the prioritized implementation of new solutions at the spokes, where there are execution teams at the, at the perimeter that are engaged with, with uh, mission or business areas to understand what their needs are. Ultimately, this sort of structure is helpful to ensure that there's cl uh, clarity and transparency around the business benefits uh, from investments in new practices that are amplified by technology. The reduction of risks that are related to new efforts and harmonizing you know, with existing the existing solution portfolio, optimizing uh, optimizing the assignment of resources to priority initiatives and working them off in order to be able to you know, bring new value and, and capabilities to the organization, and ultimately to remain engaged with with uh, the communities of key stakeholders and ensure that that ultimately new capabilities are uh, implemented with confidence. This, all of this points to the necessity that, that these activities, the organization be governed. And it impacts a, a broad swath of capability in, in the enterprise on an ongoing basis. And 
to, to tell us a little bit more about that, uh, I'd like to invite my colleague, Rand Billy. Thanks, Jim. Uh, so as Jim said, my name is Randall Billy. I am on the international government side of the house at Esri. I lead a team responsible for engagement with the global geospatial authorities. So this is really all the foundation data provi uh, providers worldwide. And before I launch into kind of the, the wrap up piece, I, I just wanna throw a quick shout out to uh, our associate, uh, Matt Lewin, uh, up in Esri Canada. He's the consulting practice director there and, and he has helped you know, aggregate and consolidate much of the material that we're presenting today. And at the end of the presentation, uh, there's links to some of his writings and blogs and I encourage you to you know, further educate yourselves. And I'm gonna beg your indulgence up front. I'm gonna talk about location intelligence and enterprise GIS really is synonymous and, and use them interchangeably. Um, and you know, talk about what we've observed, you know, building on what uh, Ben and, and Jim have already described. So what we found is that organizations with well-developed location intelligence capabilities use geospatial technology and analysis for a myriad of activities. I mean, you use them yourselves to inform decisions, to manage assets, to engage customers. And I've been a geospatial technologist for 20 years now, and I do what I do because I wholeheartedly believe that geospatial thinking makes for better decision making. And I'm gonna make an assumption that many of you feel the same way, and that's why you're here today. So Ben identified a mix of government and commercial organizations that have embraced location intelligence to kind of realign or rethink their mission objectives. And really, at the end of the day, to drive innovation. And Jim outlined some organizational strategies and, and how we work to transform the enterprise. And as we kind of go through uh, the next set, which is a set of recommendations, really a list of priorities we think organizations really need to embrace, I challenge you to think or consider a question. And think about your organization or your agency for a moment. So among your leadership, is location intelligence recognized and perceived as an important strategic enabler? I mean, this is really key. Do you even consider, uh, you know, is it critical to an organization's success? Oh, excuse me. Um, the success. And, you know, as we kind of walk through these recommendations, I want to think about where you are in your particular journey towards the enterprise GIS. So we're going to go through this list of uh, recommendations, and we've invited a guest to uh, join us today to provide some insight into her own experience and that of her organizations. So I'd like to introduce uh, Shannon Hamm. She's the Associate Deputy Administrator for Policy and Programs at APHIS. Uh, title is up there, and Shannon, welcome. Thank you so much, Randall. Can you all hear me? Yes. Great. Um, so thanks, Randall, and thanks, Dolores, for inviting me uh, to participate today. I'm both honored and humbled to, to speak with all of you today, knowing that everybody's mind is, is probably focused on the COVID-19 response, as I am at uh, APHIS. Um, I'm on two different COVID-19 um, incident management teams. So APHIS, uh, just at a very high level, um, I am the APHIS geospatial champion and executive level uh, champion or, or uh, person for our geospatial responses. And I have brought us into the, uh, not the 21st century, but at least the 20th century. And we are an emergency response agency. So we have over 8,000 employees in our agency and we are frontline. We are out there responding to animal and plant diseases uh, in the United States and testing and looking around the world. So we are very much uh, frontline. And so everything we do is um, based on a geospatial location. And that means we do have location intelligence and that should be a strategic goal and a strategic covenant that we respond to. So that's something I have brought to our agency. Um, and I'll, I'll stop there. All right, thanks, Shannon. So 
So we're going to hear more from Shannon as we kind of move through these different priorities and invite her kind of kind of like color commentary to kind of um, provide some perspective. So we kind of laid out a framework for successful technology adoption that relies on more than the capabilities of the technology. You know, oftentimes Esri is uh, you know kind of put uh, put up as an example of technology first. Well. Obviously, we're a software vendor. We believe in our technology. But what we've learned through the last 50 years is it takes more than technology to be successful. And that's why we're here. Really, it's essential that leadership creates a location intelligence vision. They establish the governance. They develop and supervise the implementation strategy and monitor and adjust as necessary. I mean, it's an it's a evolving uh, operation. So here are the eight priorities we're going to walk through. Consider them recommendations. Uh, consider that many of them or all of them would have associated action plans. Uh, and that's what some of the material uh, at the end will kind of help you with. So as we move along, think about you know, how can we teach an organization's leadership that location intelligence is a strategic and competitive asset. So first up is the strategic plan. You know, Jim described strategy formulation, uh, but the foundation of that is the plan. And this is where an organization defines how they leverage location intelligence to create business or mission value. And, and that's the imperative, right? You know, we don't do this just for the sake of the GIS and the technology. It is about the business or mission imperative. So location intelligence strategic plans are in place to direct the comprehensive use of spatial data throughout the organization. And the purpose is to create policy and organizational frameworks that enable geodata to be used throughout the value chain for government or societal or commercial purposes. So in the plan, we typically outline the formal GIS governance, and this could include establishing committee structures, user and working groups, much of what Jim described, uh, identifying the leadership advocacy, going back to the concept of champions and sponsors, uh, and I'm going to turn it over to Shannon to describe her experience. Thanks, Randall. Um, yeah, Jim's talk really did resonate with me um, as a uh, geospatial champion in our agency. And as, as you sort of got a glimmer, we are a very um, dispersed agency across the world. And it's, you know, our journey is not over in making our location intelligence a strategic enabler for better data-driven decisions, but our, our journey was rooted in our leadership's vision and how our agency is organized and its values that the employee's ability to be boots on the ground, and that's what we are, needs to be accounted for in a geospatial way because we're putting them in harm's way every day, even if it's just doing their mission delivery. So. Uh, with those tenants, we have um, developed this GIS um, governance structure. We have a charter that we developed, um, and it's been signed by all of the members of uh, the program leaders group. So APHIS has deputy administrators for each program and then associate deputy administrators for each program. And I'm the associate deputy administrator. And the associate deputy administrators have a uh, organizational structure called the program leaders group. I say we are the powerhouse for the agency because we do all the real work. The deputy administrators do the blah, blah, blah. You know, they have to deal with all the other work. And I hope I don't denigrate anything, but I'm just speaking up for what we do. And so all of the associate deputy administrators signed the charter and it has been alive and well um, and working for us. Uh, and one of the things that the associate deputy administrators agreed to that I championed was setting up a portal to take the authoritative data that has been tied up in uh, silos, uh, clean it, geocode it, make it accessible, and build once, use many times. So those were our tenants of success to get our, our GIS portal up. And that was the, the foundational piece of the GIS charter of getting us all using similar data. Um, and that was a struggle. But <clears throat> continue on, Randall. Thanks, Shannon. So this is a big, important concept. You know, location intelligence as an essential capability. I mean, that's that's a hallmark of successful uh, 
effort. So we kind of move towards data stewardship, and we're not going to talk, you know, considerably about kind of the data, but you know, we recognize that geospatial technology and data are the foundation of the organization's location intelligence ability. And you know, for many years before returning to Esri, I supported an organization that hired you know a cadre of data scientists to do data wrangling against all their petabytes of enterprise data. And you know, while they had a chief data officer or CDO, they lacked a coherent enterprise approach for data stewardship. And, and really, it was because the CDO lacked the acquisition authority to mandate data compliance. Now, I just threw the term data at you more times than was probably necessary. But I mean, I really want to focus on how important, you know, data stewardship goes hand in hand with data governance. You know, how do you prepare data for search and discovery across the organization and for further analysis? And, you know, an organizational approach to enterprise data curation is absolutely necessary to achieving interoperability and data sharing. So my slides already advanced on me, so we'll move to stakeholder management. You know, the strategic and implementation, excuse me, implementation planning needs uh, basically comprise all of the relevant stakeholders. And this means the organization's leadership and all their lines of business or mission areas have to be represented. So we need to build this idea of inclusiveness. Uh, and with that, we can build an organizational culture that encourages innovation and collaboration and promotes the awareness of the power of location throughout the organization. So you know, there are really three principles to stakeholder management that I, I want to reinforce. First, you know, supporting geospatial innovation from the highest levels of leadership. And we've talked about that continuously uh, through the webinar. Second, promoting location intelligence actively and broadly across their respective divisions. And lastly, you know, this fosters collaboration, uh, you know, through those multiple lines of business, ones that we wouldn't see otherwise. So I'm going to hand it back over to Shannon to address. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Randall. Those are really good three points. Um, and as an emergency response agency, and as a an agency that has uh, very different uh, organizational structures underneath this umbrella we call APHIS, Animal Plant Health Inspection Service, we do animal health, we do plant health, we do um, biotechnology regulatory activities. We uh, implement the Animal Welfare Act. Um, and under wildlife services, we look at taking care of predator damage management or rabies mitigation along the um, Appalachian uh, Mountains. So we have a, that, that sounds like a very, to me, it's a very broad um, construct. And putting everybody together has been um, a great opportunity to learn from each other. And when we first um, got together, uh, everybody said, oh, no, 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 we can't share our data. We, you know, we're unique. We do this, you do that. And so we brought our use cases together and, and started, and Esri was part of this, uh, started sharing our use cases. And all of a sudden we realized our, our geospatial needs were pretty much identical. And we have um, come together in that space to share our data more and establish um, a coordinated uh, collaborative component. But if I have three things I would say that agencies need to do if they're very dispersed are you need to have that enthusiastic champion, which I guess I am. Uh, you need to have use cases to show your resistant uh, employees, which you have. They have more similarities and differences and that you have to repeat that often. You have to use those use cases and and twist them and update them, make sure everybody's staying on the same page because we really, your agency all is really coordinated even if you think it's very different. Um, and to build those relationships and trust across the agency as well as with your USDA GIO office because they really will help you if you're going to do something enterprise wise or you're going to set up a portal um, or you're going to, implement uh, the Esri enterprise-wise management services, you really need the top level um, advocate at the department, whatever department you're working at, at the department level. 
And so that takes time, effort, and resources. Um, and it's hard to do all of these things, but it is doable. It's not rocket science. It's just, you know, head down, full force on, and just, you know, um, not allowing uh, some of the bureaucratic infrastructure to get in your way of knowing that you're doing the right thing. Thank you, Randall. Uh, perfect. So you you discussed organizational structure as part of part of that. Um, yeah. So how you organize is really the link between your GIS strategy and in this case the strategic plan, and then how you execute on your day to day operations. So and Jim described this in quite a bit of detail. You know, my own practical experience was with an effort uh, called the Scope Cell, uh, where we embedded geospatial technologists and developers with their mission specialists and other subject matter experts uh, into the organization. I mean, obviously this was, well, this was done at a micro scale basis, but it was incredibly productive. And at the time, it, extremely novel for how we approached on the integration of geospatial personnel and capabilities into the broader mission area. You know, on top of that, what we need to focus on is that successful organizations ensure the support for location intelligence solutions and services is integrated into the larger IT portfolio and is not treated as you know that niche or boutique capability and, and put off to the side. I think you have something similar to share, Shannon. Okay, getting that mute button off. Um, yes, of course. So uh, very well stated, Randall. I think uh, one thing we have found um, in this administration, the um, one of the, the the goals of our current secretary is to create um, customer service centers or centers of excellence, and to consolidate all those who deliver software or IT services. And as the geospatial champion, I advocated to the highest levels that our geospatial analysts aren't IT specialists. They are trained practitioners and need to be embedded with the programs where the data is created. APHIS is very unique. We actually collect data and create data that um, is really not publicly available, but needs to be available for our geospatial analysts to evaluate and see if our programs are effective and spending those appropriated dollars. So we were successful in advocating that our geospatial analysts stay with the programs, and that makes it very uh, helpful for me when I have data calls, like right now on the COVID-19 um, emergency uh, response effort or the incident management team, I'm able to do data calls with my geospatial steering committee in a heart, you know, in, in seconds, and then responding back to me, yes, we have this data, yes, we have that data. No, we can't create that metric for this Tableau dashboard. So if I would not have that ability if they'd all been centrally located in an, uh, an IT information technology division. So keeping them with the programs is paramount to making you successful. Thanks, Randall. All right, thank you. So we're just touch on the kind of the technology really quick because I don't want this is not the focus of today, but why I am going to bring it up is because you know we we know that the best organizations implement a technology architecture that promotes scalability and flexibility, and one that enables easy access and promotes sharing both internally as well as externally to downstream customers and, and consumers. And I bring this up because we work with a lot of national mapping agencies and and other foundation data providers. And we often talk to them about proving relevancy of their organization and the mission to government stakeholders. And you know why? Because there's so many alternatives today that are available commercially that they're often defending their budgets in front of their, uh, their elected officials. You know, one way for the organization to do that is to co-create content with their consumers. I mean, this is the, this is really a novel concept that I first heard addressed uh, to me by Dave Henderson, who's the Chief Geospatial Officer at Ordnance Survey Great Britain. 
And it, it kind of blew me away at the time, the talk about this idea of co-creating content and having a found a, kind of a, a solution system that was so flexible and adaptable that they could do that. Um, and think about how powerful that is as a mission or business driver. You know, that can't be achieved through monolithic or static systems. It really needs to have an evolved IT solution where location intelligence is part of the foundation and not an add-on. And once we establish, you know, what those solutions are, um, we can really kind of focus on uh, identifying the types of systems and the understand that this leads us down the path to figure out what we need to train on you know what are the organization's essential skills and more importantly which ones are missing where's our gaps you know professional development is integral to enabling and sustaining a location intelligence ability you know we're not talking about vanilla flavored it and we've all had difficulty recruiting the appropriate talent and even at esri we have that challenge you know Organizations need to make a concerted effort to provide opportunities to develop skills and competencies organically. Shannon, you guys are doing something uh, about that over at APHIS? Well, we are trying, um, as probably most federal agencies are facing, you're facing the uh, retirement wave. And uh, so we are trying to do new things, hiring new disciplines, whether they be data scientists, um, as a myself, a trained economist, I'm now looking for economists that also have uh, are also geographers, so that they uh, can do both asking the thoughtful analytical questions, but also handle the data. So we don't need a separate set that we have an integrated team. Um, and then, you know, not to um, overstate this, but I think the partnership with Esri is is very successful because uh, you speak with one voice and we can uh, work with you without competing vendors, if you will, and understand you know, how we can solve certain problems. Um, so that's been, I think the team approach is very, very successful. And I know that um, we are still onboarding during this, this COVID-19 uh, response. I'm actually hiring, um, uh, a economist geospatial analyst as we speak a recent grad um and uh so that's you know we just need to keep building those kinds of uh workforce um and move this into a, a new uh way of doing business so getting out of your traditional oh i just need a data analyst you know a st statistician no think differently you just definitely need to think take risk um, sometimes you might make a mistake, but more times than not, you're going to learn from the risk you've taken and, you know, no pain, no gain is my adage. So, um, and workforce, we would be nothing without our workforce. So I just, I can't speak more seriously about the need to make workforce and authoritative data two of your highest uh, covenants or tenants that you're looking for as and federal agencies because without one you can't have the other and you can't have a strategic plan you can't have anything if you don't have your workforce and you don't have your ability to hire so thanks randall all right no thank you i appreciate you reinforcing that message so you just two more to round out our conversation and our priorities here you know the second to last is outreach you know, providing access to geospatially driven services allows us to engage in active outreach with our customers and our user community. In the you know, promotion awareness within the organization are just as important. You know, think about organizational GIS days and, and innovation competitions as ways to spread awareness on location intelligence. And over time, you'll build out that organization's spatial literacy and this will pay dividends. And exactly as, as Shannon just described. And, and lastly is this concept of, you know, procurement. Now, in a past life, I was actually a, a certified DOD acquisition professional. Uh, I'm not going to try to teach you about procurement. Uh, I do want to note that, you know, GIS and geospatial technologies are evolving at such a rapid pace 
we just need to look at how the industry has responded to the COVID pandemic. And it's, you know, it's awe-inspiring. I mean, I want you to stop and reflect for just a moment. Did you ever imagine a time when the term contact tracing would be part of the daily news cycle or that a Johns Hopkins University map dashboard would be getting a billion hits a day? I mean, they certainly didn't, but they were, you know, they had a, a flexible, scalable architecture to help them meet their demand. What I will say is that close and direct alignment between location intelligence strategy and the organization's corporate and IT strategy is, is key to success. And this location intelligence should serve and enable the mission. And that's that's a concept that we've, we've continued to uh, reiterate. You know, strong strategic alignment ensures investments in location intelligence are made where it matters most. You know, we need to program budgets for geospatial infrastructure and investment in location intelligence, just like any other recurring infrastructure costs. And simply put, organizations need to create a GIS investment strategy. So here, let's just kind of recap, you know, these are our eight priorities. These are our recommendations that you focus on from an organizational perspective to be successful at implementing enterprise GIS. Shannon, do you have any uh, final conclusions you want to share? Sure. Thanks, Randall. And thanks, everyone who's been participating today. I know everybody's super busy. Um, first of all, yeah, to the procurement um, reoccurring services that should be integrated in some type of um, what we call central services repeating uh, bill, because uh, having access to this uh, capability is key to your success. So procurement should not be the obstacle for you being able to move into the 21st century. Um, so be imaginative in figuring out how to make that happen. But um, really, just don't take your foot off the pedal, uh, you know, the gas pedal right now. Um, I know these are different times. I will not use the word or term new norm. This is not new norm. This is just different times. But don't take your foot off the gas pedal. Uh, we need geospatial more now than ever. I'm living that daily, nightly, and weekends. <laughs> um, <laughs> You definitely need a hiring strategy for the new types of your analysts that you want to hire. Don't be afraid to go outside your norm. Find a PD. There's um, OPM has tons of different types of PDs they can help you with. Take risk. It does pay off. You might take some heat for it, but if you have your uh, foundational balance, you will be able to justify that. Uh, to that point, show value for this investment to your senior leadership. We did a return on investment for our senior leadership of building this portal. The portal didn't cost nothing, by the way. So building that portal did cost the agency money, and I did a return on investment um, with that and showed the value of that investment, and it does show value. Um, you know, and then basically we all need to collaborate more. I mean, I'm, I also do, uh, we're a regulatory agency, um, so we have this, you know, we have an agency regulatory group. We definitely have an agency geospatial group, but we need to broad that out to a federal level geospatial group where we talk about our issues and our problems um, because they are more similar than different. And that's my whole basis of use cases. When we bring our use cases to fruition, we can see the similarities. And I think we can really help each other um, to do a better job of these data-driven decisions with this location intelligence. And so again, I thank everyone who's been on the, the webinar and I'm very honored and humbled to have been asked to do this presentation. Thanks so much, everyone. And well, I'll you. be here for questions. Yeah, I, I'm really impressed with where you and the APHIS leadership have taken the organization. And, um, and uh, I know this falls short, but kudos. I mean, just fantastic work. So. Now for the others, you know, challenge your organization to think spatially. And you know, when leaders think geospatially, I mean, they visualize, they detect patterns, they can more fully predict the situations that matter to the organizations and to the nation. So I'm going to turn it back over to Ben. Great, thanks, Ryan. That was fantastic. Thank you so much, Shannon. That was, I think, amazing to have all those additional comments and you know, addressing some of the questions we were getting from the audience about you know the challenges you faced and how you overcame them. And I think really, you know, we heard a lot about demonstrating the value of that return on investment, the focus on workforce and data, 
and really collaboration and working together. And I think that's for me, that's what it comes back to is that, you know, most of you on this call represent various government agencies or um, companies that support these agencies. And I think at the end of the day, you know, our, our mission is to support, work together to solve these big problems to serve citizens and country. And we see GIS as being the core piece of that. And we see hopefully you all as being those champions or sponsors of those capabilities across your organization. Um, in order to help you with that, we'd we'll be happy to um, provide some of the resources from today. So there's an additional handout that um, made available that has these links in there. But I just encourage you to take a look at the um, ARC News Managing GIS series, some of the training classes we have on preparing for change and change management consulting, which actually helps you with this process approach to um, implementing GIS in your organization, as well as the references from MIT um, that we discussed earlier. And then as, as Rand mentioned, the, the work done by Esri Canada and specifically Matt Lewin um, has been amazing. It's been a great resource for us as we put this material together. Um, and it's really based on uh, the collective knowledge of a lot of experienced people doing these, these, this work. Um, we're happy to take some questions. I know we are actually over time, so some of you are probably dropping off now as we speak. But if you have any questions, make sure you actually insert them into the box. Um, we can spend a few minutes answering those questions. Um, understand, of course, um, Shannon, if you need to drop off or if anybody else needs to drop off, but we'll be happy to take some questions. For those of you that are leaving, I do want to point out that we have, um, this is the first webinar in our 2020 series, um, and we're happy to have you attend um, these future webinars, um, looking more about these applications to technology. So we move beyond the technology, but we'll be coming back and we'll be talking a lot about the use cases and workflows um, and these applications that you can apply on um, these enterprise level, agency level operations, department level operations, like we've talked about today. So hopefully those webinars can give you some inspiration on the applications of the technology. So I think, um, I don't see any questions coming in. I'm guessing people are done for the day. So I appreciate um, everybody joining. And, and I think, you know, the questions that were asked earlier, it looks like we've answered those through the comments that. Um, that you that were given by everybody um, of our on our presenters. So I really appreciate everybody joining today and With this video it will be made available along with the short survey when you exit. So with that um, I'll go ahead and close it out and thanks everybody um, for joining today